All right, everyone. Um, so we are in the midst of a global economic and health emergency, as you know. Um, I'll go over a few things from the, the, the course. I think I'll <clears throat> try and sleep uh, in, in the next couple of days and kind of return <clears throat> to some of this material to try and um, to make sure I cover everything. So just a, a reminder, you know, we'll have a pack back on uh, Tuesday, we'll be discussing chapter uh, seven on unemployment and the recession, which I'll talk more about today. Um, and I'll also post kind of a tutorial going over the, the how to find your groups on Canvas and everything. I know that, you know, right now some of you are trying to get back to your dorms and, you know, coming back to State College and having to go home again or stranded somewhere. So, you know, just focus on your own lives, uh, most of all. So today I'm not really going to, you know, introduce new, well, I am going to introduce some new information, um, but not a lot, not not an incredible amount. And, and for the most part, I'm going to be trying to link uh, some stuff we've talked about in class to, to COVID-19 because everything is changing quite dramatically. Um, so I'll talk about the spread of COVID-19 first, then I'm going to talk about the effects on uh, the economy. The bad news, figure out where to put myself, okay, the bad news is, as the headline there shows, the worst is yet to come. Um, <clears throat> Based on serious, or people that I take seriously, we're looking at potentially one to two million deaths, maybe more in the United States, directly caused by COVID-19 uh, over the course of the next one to two years. Most of that is probably going to happen in the next one to three months. So again, this is it's going to be growing exponentially. So I'm going to explain that um, a, a bit. Okay. So, COVID-19, unemployment, and the recession. Uh, let's talk about the, the economy for just a moment. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, hopefully those are just allergies. Um, so, nearly 80 million jobs in the U.S. are, are at risk or at moderate moderate risk, according to Moody's Analytics. Uh, job figures were announced at 8.30 this morning. I haven't looked at those yet. Um, anyway, so you know, roughly half of the jobs in America are going to be severely affected. Not everyone is are, is going to lose their job, um, but but a lot of people a lot of people will, and a lot of people are going to see huge reductions in pay. I've seen some estimates that six million people could lose their jobs, at least temporarily, in the restaurant sector. And just to give you some idea of how how much six million people um, in the restaurant industry. The total number of job losses in the Great Recession was 8 million. Think about that. Okay, we'll return there. So first of all, some stuff about the disease itself. Um, well, before that, uh, we talked a lot about social media and the spread of information through through social media on these classes, the pros and cons, and uh, so on and so forth. So these are just some people who I take seriously. I, you know, you might want to follow them on Twitter. They've, they've been posting some really good stuff. Um, there are a lot of others too. So anyway, that's there for you. And these slides, besides this video, the slides themselves will be posted uh, in the modules. Okay, so maybe a good place to start is uh, you've seen the and you've been probably been engaged in these uh, frantic runs to the store to get toilet paper. Um, so think about that. Everyone's running to the store to get toilet paper now. Just imagine the same things happening, uh, but it's at the hospital. And instead of toilet paper, people are trying to uh, get ventilators. People are trying to get beds, uh, intensive care unit beds, and so on. That's why the world is shutting down. That's why America is shutting down, and so on. So a lot of people don't are still a little bit behind what's going on, and so was I <laughs> a few weeks ago. I you know, I think over the last couple of weeks I've you know kind of gotten ahead of the curve in some of the in some of this information. But um, as I said, uh, it is fast moving. So remember uh, the this little story about uh, just going to go over exponential growth again. Remember the king is you know doesn't want to give money or gold to the inventor of chess. Um, there's other 
other versions of it. Uh, so he gives one grain of wheat, actually it's rice in the real version, on the first square, two on the second, four on the third for all the 64 squares on the board. So remember this is doubling for, for each square on the board, and this is maybe a good way that you can explain to your, your parents maybe, um, and other skeptical friends or skeptical people um, who may not understand why COVID-19 is really spreading the way it is. Um, and it's because people don't understand exponential growth. So remember, um, you know, we talked about this before, but you know, we get, once you start doubling, uh, once start, things start growing exponentially, they, they really take off. Okay, and you know, you remember this chart that we went, went over uh, earlier this semester. So the frightening thing here is that COVID-19 is on an exponential uh, growth curve. Uh, putting myself all over. Uh, so <clears throat> Just briefly, this is comparing the uh, rate of infection, looking at how contagious it is compared to several other other diseases. So you see COVID-19 um, is likely to, inf each person is likely to, to, to infect 2 to 3.1 uh, other people. Let's remember an average here. So this is much more more infectious than the seasonal flu. The seasonal flu is 1.3, so you know, twice as much or more. Um, it's more so than the norovirus, or at least, you know, roughly about the same, you know, more than the norovirus uh, going towards the, the upper end there. Um, not as much as the measles, you know, measles, you can see why that's wiped out lots of people. Now, this is a good time to think about the future. Think about, you know, COVID-19 isn't the last pandemic humanity is going to face. Uh, imagine something like COVID-19, but has the infection rate of measles, where it's, you know, where you're infecting 11 to 18 uh, people. And imagine it hitting the young or something like this. That could be, you know, really catastrophic. So it's really, you know, time to time to really build our social systems to 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 handle these things, or at least you know, be ready for them. Okay, so this is one chart I do want to go back to. Uh, so I'm not going to over some of the technical stuff here, but basically this is a COVID-19 lag tracker that's from about three or four days ago. This is looking at the looking at days since the first confirmed case um, and how many days they are behind Italy. So, you know, Italy's in a major lockdown crisis right now, running out of hospital beds in, in, in some of their hardest hit regions and soon nationally. And you see many other countries uh, are, are on the same trajectory. So this dotted line here, that's that's Italy. Uh, the USA, we're about 20 days, so some, I would say six, now 16 or 14, 13, 12, some, just a few days behind Italy. Um, France is this orange line uh, and so on. Here's another look at it. Someone else, another analysis someone else did. Again, you've got the gray line here representing Italy. Um, you know, cases going up there. This dark line is the United States, and as you can see, uh, you know, we're, we're, it's like someone's drawing right over the, the Italy line. Uh, the cases in the UK after they, you know, they're they're going up too. Iran is really is really skyrocketing. As you know, there's a huge huge crisis there. Uh, you see the same. Thing happening with Spain. Uh, Spain really is taking off too. Uh, this was China. This looking, you know, just a few days into each each place, um, you know, and China had really taken off. China has now uh, leveled off for the for for the moment. Okay, so. <clears throat> In my intro to sociology class, we talked about social networks, and I'm not going to go over this in, in too much detail other than, other than to show this is um, a, an, an, looking at an analysis of the spread of uh, H1N1 back in 2009. So those are these are what we call social networks. Each of those sort of little dots are people. Uh, the lines are are call them, well, we call the dots, uh, nodes, the lines, you can call lines or, or, or other things. Um, important point being the length of the lines determine the, the 
the proximity of the relationship. And they can be measured in different ways. So this is looking at, at, at friends. I believe this is the, yeah, how, I believe this is how, how it spread at uh, Harvard University. So you see that people in the center, in the middle, tend to be, you know, in the center of a social network, meaning that they are connected to a lot of people. Uh, the people that they're connected to are connected to a lot of people and so on. These tend to be people who are more extroverted, gregarious, outgoing, and so on. Um, you know, usually, sometimes that can be great if, you know, if there's information going through a network, you know, they're more likely to get it uh, early on. Uh, if there's a flu going through the network, they're more likely to get it early on. So you see it spread through the network really beginning, uh, you know, for the most part beginning in, in sort of the center areas and spreading outward. Um, not necessarily, you know, Exactly, but, but that's the general spread you see uh, over time in this chart. Okay, so this chart comes from the, uh, the paper, I'm trying to touch my face, uh, from a paper that comes out of Imperial College London. And this, this, this paper made the British and American governments change their tune. So this is looking at what would happen if nothing, if no action were taken. Uh, the black line is Great Britain, the red line is the United States. Uh, you see huge spikes really happening in May and June um, with a peak of about 50,000 deaths per day in the United States. This is if no action is taken. Um, we're looking at, you know, a lot of deaths. This is why, you know, as I said, we're going to see most of the deaths probably happen the next uh, next one to three months or so. Okay, so this is what people are talking about when they talk about flattening the curve. So again, look back here, you got the big spike. The problem with this big spike um, is, and the other thing I should point out, so you got the big spike here in, in the summer. We don't know where this, where COVID-19 is going, so it'll probably spike back up again in, uh, in the fall and winter uh, during the regular flu season. So that's kind of alarming. Okay, so the flattening the curve. So basically the problem with, you know, these huge spikes in infection rates um, is that it overloads the healthcare capacity. So you see that dotted line there. Uh, that's where, you know, how much the healthcare can take before it just cannot handle any more cases. So Italy is at that point. Uh, several hospitals at in Italy have, have, have gone beyond it. Um, this is why you saw China build huge hospitals, just you know, start building up huge hospitals. <laughs> um, and most other countries don't have the, the ability to do that. So this is a big, big crisis. This is why social distancing is so important. Social distancing uh, keeps the infection rates Less, it kind of it, it prolongs how long the infection stays around, uh, but it, it keeps it from jumping high enough that it overloads the healthcare system. So you know, so hunker down. This is going to be this is going this is going to take take some time. We're going to be battling this for for several months uh, ahead. How, well, has this worked? Has social distancing worked? Yeah, you can see here the effect of social distancing uh, on the 1918 flu. And I know, you know, we're at Penn State University, um, so, you know, let's look at Philadelphia. Uh, you see this is the 1918 flu where you had, you know, the, that, that huge flu go through, it killed 150 million people worldwide, or roughly or so, maybe more. Um, anyway, uh, so you see there that uh, social distancing, they started doing it already. All right. in, in Philadelphia, they started doing it after the exponential growth curve had already kicked in. St. Louis, they got their first case earlier, and so they started implementing social distance uh, just two days later. Um, and as you see there, they didn't have nearly the, 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 the infection rate, uh, or I'm sorry, the, the, well, neither the infection rate nor the death rate. Um, they held it down. Uh, as you can see, though, there was a spike uh, later on um, when, you know, when, when winter came during, you know, during flu season. Okay. So the big problem and scandal in the United States, political scandal, is the lack of testing. So in, on January 25th, China had 930 million people locked down. 
Um, think about that. The population of the United States is about 320 million. China had 930 people, million uh, people locked down, uh, some people severely restricted. Um, so America could have been using that time to prepare people, especially personnel, uh, who are going to be at the front lines. We did not, and we did not ramp up testing, or we didn't do anything. We, we tried to pretend like nothing was going on. Um, there will be huge, huge co political consequences for for these lack of decisions or these whatever. So as you can see here, South Korea is testing about 3,600 people per day or per million people out of a population of 50 million people. The United States is testing about 23, uh, 23 people per million in a population of 330 million. So this thing is, is taking off, uh, spreading through social networks exponentially, and we're not, uh, we're not capturing it in our testing. Okay, so let's kind of switch now, now that we have a good idea you know, sort of how this thing is spreading and how drastic it could get. Hard to touch, hard to, hard to not touch your face. Uh, so let's look at the economic impact now. Get a drink. <clears throat> okay. So um, first of all, we know just generally that unemployment has a huge negative impact. Um, it's been, been linked to depression, low levels of self-esteem, increased mortality rates, uh, long-term unemployment really, you know, people fall into debt, uh, they don't have savings, you know, they start saving later, uh, a whole bunch of bad things can happen. And we're gonna definitely see uh, see some of these things in this current recession. The, 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 the frightening thing is that this may be much more disruptive than previous economic crises because of the fact that you have illness, it's a healthcare crisis, and isolation. Uh, you know, just is going to have a huge, huge impact on people's mental health. And, you know, social media could be great here, or <laughs> who knows, it could, be, uh, it could be problematic in some ways. Uh, we shall see. Okay, so as I said, you know, why some of you probably should, you know, be concerned. Um, we know that when students graduate during a recession, this has a huge impact on uh, their lifetime earnings. So this happened back in 2009. <clears throat> you see a big slumps in hiring back in 2009. It kind of came back up uh, later on, you know, went booming for a while. But, you know, as I said, we tend to see um, that people who graduate during a recession, uh, their earnings, as you, as you can see in this other chart here, tend to be smaller, um, <laughs> smaller uh, than, than those who graduate before a recession or after one. So I know, you know, many of you are graduating this semester and you're, you know, we're hoping to enter a booming economy where there are lots of jobs available and that's probably not going to be the case now. So you know, hang in there. We'll hope that, you know, we can tackle the health crisis so we can, you know, so we can tackle the, the economic crisis that's going to be following. Um, okay, so this, again, this is going to hit you, you pretty hard. And not just those of you who are graduating this year, but those of you who are graduating three or four years. Um, this is going to play out and reshape the world economy in ways that we, we just don't know yet. What we do know is that you know it's crashing. You know, we every day we see we see we see uh, frightening numbers. Um, yeah, you can just look at CNBC, Wall Street Journal, Market Watch, any of those, and and they'll, <laughs> and they'll give you a panic attack if you if you if you need if you need more of one. Okay, so when we look at unemployment, let's look at the last recession. I cannot not touch my face. Okay, so you know, we see that unemployment jumped in roughly, you know, started going up in 2007, started spiking in 2008, uh, really came to a peak towards the end of uh, 2009, and slowly started following, uh, falling uh, from from 2010 on. In 2009, there was a major fiscal stimulus act. We're seeing something similar. You know, it's 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 sort of a different situation. Um, 
uh, different situation. So, you know, we don't know how, how much this fiscal stimulus uh, will help. It sounds like there will be about a thousand to two thousand dollar checks sent out to everyone. That's what the federal government has proposed now. Um, the Democratic candidate Bernie Sanders is saying, you know, it's probably going to be needed two thousand dollars a month. Uh, I think that might be more realistic. Again, it will just depend on how how quickly we can um, control things. But we, you know, we need to think about having the, the, the most of the country shut down and what that means for landlords, for uh, for, for renters. Um, but you know, landlords need to get get their rent too and so you know this is big this is a, a, a an incredibly complex um problem we have okay so this is the sort of normal you know kind of uh market investment sort of cycle you get optimism excitement people are feeling you know euphoria that was just a few weeks ago in the united states as uh you know the stock market was hitting you know records and you know, it was going to go about thirty thousand. that was a big thing now it's below twenty thousand. so um so we see we're down you know down in around uh, look down on there pan somewhere between panic and depression I'm not, I'm not quite sure where we're at i think we're still in in panic right panic mode right now um so anyway just you know the markets may come up at some at some point but you know we'll, we'll see what happens okay as we talked about last time you know the just the definition of the recession um you know and just you know all the charts everybody is basically in agreement that there's a recession coming bank of america said yesterday that uh, it's already here so uh, here we are okay so let's look at the last recession. So the last recession, when the markets crashed in 2008, I told my students that the last time we saw a market crash like this, it was followed by uh, 10 years of economic depression, uh, a world war, and a holocaust. So we did not see, obviously, in the last 10 years, a world war, a great depression, or a holocaust. We did see a great recession. We did see the rise of, as we'll talk about next week when we talk about race and ethnicity, uh, we, we have seen the rise of racial supremacist and nationalist movements and so on, um, just like we did back in the 1930s and things like that. So once again, as we're hitting another economic collapse, there's going to be these sort of unintended and unforeseen consequences. So when in the last recession, the highest rate that unemployment got, official rate, was, was about 10%. Other people estimate unofficial 15 to 20% maybe. Um, at, at least at certain times. So official rate, 10%. That was in 2009. Uh, at the beginning of this year, American unemployment was only 3.6%. Um, there's speculation that we could see it grow to 20% in, in this current recession. 20%. That's twice That's twice as much unemployment as the last recession. The difference is that the last recession played out over several months, over a couple of years. Uh, this is playing out all at once. It's just, you know, like a slamming on the brake. So it's a bit, it's, a, it's, a, it's more uncertain. So just to com compare with the Great Depression, <laughs> so this is not a, a sorry, this is not good news. Uh, the highest unemployment rate during the Great Depression was 25%. Uh, and then as you see, it fell from 1932 on, spiked again as you got another little recession back in, in the late 1930s and fell uh, due to the war and wartime production. Um, we need to do sort of wartime production, but of masks and ventilators. I mean, sort of, you know, excuse me. Um, so that's... That's, you know, something, I guess, <laughs> one way in which to, to, to build up the economy. Um, I've already seen seen just through my social networks on social media just the way the different ways this is playing out. Um, a lot of my friends who have college degrees or masters or you know higher education degrees uh, work at jobs where they can work from home, where they can work remotely. And then I have a lot of friends who work at jobs where you can't work remotely, where you work at a where you, you have to go places. You know, there's no you can't work at a factory from home. You can't work uh, at a child care facility from home. And so a lot of them have already I've seen lost their jobs, and they are now um, starting to receive 
are looking at Amazon because Amazon is hiring uh, people in warehouses in large numbers as people are, are trying to order stuff. Um, so frightening, kind of frightening stuff there. Looking at the Great Depression versus the Great Recession, let's give us some idea. So, you know, again, um, the the unemployment rates, you know, might get higher. We're looking probably somewhere in between the Great Recession and the Great Depression. So, yeah, so buckle up, everyone. Um, the last time this caused a huge crisis in Europe that, that came a couple years after. So remember, the, the, the last economic crisis started in the American housing market. Um, that blew up, blew up the American financial sector, which, with, which then went global, uh, exposed a number of severe, you know, public debts in, in, in the European Union. Uh, and so you saw unemployment just skyrocketing uh, in, in a lot of Southern Europe, in Spain, Greece, Portugal, uh, as well as places like Ireland and, and, and Italy. Um, you know, and they've just now, just in the last couple of years, started to sort of recover, and now they're getting hit by this. And of course, Italy is getting hit, hit extra hard. So um, really, again, you know, really you know, potential scary stuff. The, the European sovereign debt crisis in, in, in the European Union happened two years after um, the financial crisis of 2008. You know, when the start, stuff started crashing in 2008, you saw um, it was really 2010 that the sovereign debt crisis in Europe uh, got going. So you can see that myself down here. So you can see uh, that, you know, some places are at higher risk than others. Uh, <clears throat> so in terms of manufacturing and parts and so on, um, places that are at medium risk, medium low risk, automotive, um, some pharmacy is at medium, uh, is at medium risk. Other places are at, you know, higher risk, high tech, interestingly. I mean, that's you know, something to think about. Um, you know, prepare for the internet to stop working, or you know, things like that. Um, as as you're as you're self isolating, uh, apparel, retail, all that stuff. That that stuff is you know going to get hit uh, pretty hard. Okay. Um, you know, and obviously places that are highly connected to China in the United States and around the world are, are being hit. So, you know, China's going to get hit economically too. They already have, um, by the initial, by their initial slowdown and, you know, the, just the fall in consumption in China. But then when the world stops spending, you know, that also is going to hit China too. So this is going to be a big deal for, uh, for China's economy as well. We don't know how much consumption has fallen yet. Um, we know that it's going to be much worse, much, much worse, as I say, than 2008, 2009. Why is that? Well, because you just see this huge stop of, of people spending. Um, we didn't see quite a crash in consumer spending uh, last time. So, so this is going to be big, and, and we can't, it's hard to, know yet how big and you know what's what's going on so uh, in the coming weeks and months more data will be will be available so let's think about people reducing their spending okay so what do people spend on housing well okay so hopefully the government checks will help people who are living month to month um, so that they can pay pay their bills like I said it's uh, they may need to send out a few more checks if this is gonna be big uh, health care is a big one you know I don't know how <laughs> how health care spending is gonna work in the coming in the coming months and months ahead uh, personal insurance pensions that sort of thing uh, food that's a, that's a big one people will be stocking up transportation that's gonna go way down uh, that's why oil prices oil markets are just you know going going nuts right now there's a lot of a lot of stuff going on in, in the markets that I will, just can't get into at the moment. Um, but do you see entertainment, alcohol, beverages, that's about 6%, apparel, 3%, and so on. Now, keep in mind, those are people who are, you know, serving people food, who are serving people, you know, or you know, providing people with entertainment and so on and so forth. So, 
this I think is something to think about, uh, looking at it more sociologically in a, a broader perspective. Uh, so you see this change in terms of people's eating habits. You know, back in the 1960s, early 1960s, you know, less than 30% of people, um, you know, Oh, just looking at shares of total food, food expenditures. Um, and the green line is food away from home. It was, you know, less than 30% of total food expenditures were, you know, at restaurants and stuff like that. You know, more than 70% uh, were people buying food and making, cooking their own dinners. As you can see, those numbers have, have kind of, you know, converged or, you know, I think you know, I'm not quite sure where they're where, where they're at right now. I think actually, um, a food away from home in the last few years ha has has gone above uh, food made at home. So people have gotten accustomed to going out to eat, um, have gotten accustomed to restaurants and you know coffee shops and so on. So this is going to be a huge change in behavior. And you know, unfortunately, just given you know the, the the nature of this economic crisis, people can't just go out to stores and get fresh produce and fresh stuff. Um, you know, every few days. Uh, so people are going to be learned to cooking, learn to cook canned food and stuff like that, um, at least for the next few months. So the other kind of distressing thing, we've got this corporate debt bubble that's about to burst. I've been worried about this for, for, for some time. Um, you know, we we all sort of contribute to these economic bubbles. Uh, what's been going on over the last few years is that interest rates have been uh, very low, and so corporations have been uh, borrowing lots and lots of money and buying back their own stock. Uh, this is problematic. So this means that there are a lot of these corporations, some people are calling them zombie corporations, uh, they're just existing based on debt. They don't really have any of their own money, they're just, they just have debt. Um, the credit markets have frozen up, meaning that they're not offering any, you know, aren't offering them any loans. So I have the, a video of an interview with Nurio Rubini, some people call him Dr. Doom because he's always talking about the bad things. Uh, he was one of the people that was, you know, f that foresaw the last economic crisis. Um, so that's, you know, you, he's someone to to take it, to take seriously. That's in the modules. I made that COVID-19 module um, and you can watch that uh, for a more full uh, fuller and more complete explanation. But you can see here, okay, uh, you can see here that, you know, this is the non-financial corporate securities debt. It's been rising since the 1980s, uh, you know, it went down for a while during the 2000s. Um, when interest rates were a bit higher, um, and as you can see, when the interest rates were were, were lowered in for the last financial crisis, uh, and have been for the most part been kept low, um, corporations started piling piling up on debt. Now this is you know something that's I've been worried. <clears throat> excuse me, something that I've been worried about for the last few months you know, kind of watching this and now it's, you know, now it's very worrisome, is that we tend to see spikes in corporate debt before recessions. And you can see the, uh, those gray bars there are recessions. So you see the big corporate, big spikes in debt um, up to 1990, between in the 1990s, up to the 2000 recession, um, in the 2000s, right before you have the big housing market crash. And you've seen this big climb again uh, in the last 10 years. So, the difference is that the corporate debt level is higher uh, than it used to be. So I think that's one of the things that's a bit a bit more alarming this time around. Um, you know, and when you look, whoops, and when you look at, whoops, again, when you look at, uh, you know, the total, the total business debt um, overall, it's around 16 trillion. You know, and that's it's been growing, uh, growing since 2010, roughly. So, you know, very. This is something to watch uh, on the more macroeconomic scale. This will play out over, the, over several months and probably in the end years. But you know, this is going to be big. So, so pay attention to that. So how? So we're probably aware that <clears throat> you know it's hitting different supply chain supply chains around the world. Um, <clears throat> Americans, for the most part, you know, we like to get our stuff cheaply, which means that they're made in other parts of the world. Uh, a lot of stuff is made in, in sweatshops. Uh, about 97% of clothing, 
sue you. About 97% of clothing that's purchased in America is imported. Uh, not all of this is made in sweatshops, but a lot is. Um, so there's, you know, this may change some of that. Um, you know, I, we're just not quite sure what's going to happen here. The thing about sweatshops is that they are very abusive uh, to the workers. They're unsafe. Uh, they're, they have pretty bad environmental conditions uh, and so on. So we, we, we'll see what happens with, with sweatshops um, as the world economy probably restructure, gets restructured. In America, one of the crises that we have right now is that we don't do a good job of providing leave and, and assistance for people. You have the Family Medical Leave Act of 1993 that requires uh, employers to provide at least 12 weeks of unpaid leave for serious reasons. So, you know, child care, death of a loved one, uh, health problem, that sort of thing. Uh, but unpaid, that's the, that's the key thing. Most people can't afford to take unpaid leave, so they stay in their job um, as they're grieving the death of a loved one if they're <clears throat> facing a health crisis and so on or if they're facing COVID-19, but you know are worried about how they're gonna pay their bills. So there are all sorts of caveats to this. You know, you have to work a certain number of hours, the company has to be a certain size and so on. So that once you look at all of those things, this means that only about half of the workers are actually eligible, half of workers in the US are actually eligible for these benefits. So there, are, <clears throat> there are currently only two. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> out of, yeah, currently only two out of 185 countries that lack guaranteed maternity leave. So when mothers have, you know, have have a child, when a, a baby comes out of a mother's body, um, you know, the the United States and Papua New Guinea basically make mothers, you know, go back to work pretty quickly, or at least, you know, they don't make sure that employers give mothers, you know, proper time. Um, and this is you know, a big concern by every health professional that I, uh, or at least most, most health professionals that I know. Um, this, you know, we'll talk about healthcare specifically later on in this class, and we'll tie it in, you know, we'll, at that time we'll, you know, tie it into what's going on uh, more broadly. But this is symptomatically kind of a broader failure, a failure to provide paid sick leave. And this, you know, this has always been a problem because it leads to greater infections. Uh, you get sick people who have the flu or something, they can't afford to not miss work, so they come to work, and then they get everybody else at work sick, and then, you know, and then you get the spread of disease, and, you know, this is bad for people's health, bad for the economy, bad for, bad for everything. Um, so COVID-19 may, may change some of this. Uh, it, it looks like people are, we're going to get, as part of the stimulus package, there's going to be paid sick leave. Uh, but I know, you know, maybe slightly two sentences more than you do, maybe if, if you've read, only read the headlines about that. Okay. <clears throat> political effects. The political effects are going to be enormous. We don't know, you know, what they're going to be yet. You know, let's just start out by being very blunt and honest about the two countries that have the most power in the world, the two countries that are most consequential for the future of the human race uh, in terms of their their power and their 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 influence. Um, China and the United States. So you know, as we, as we all probably know, uh, this illness, as far as we know, began in China in Wuhan um, in November was as far as we know, it was the first documented case. The Chinese government, local officials first, and then the broader government tried to kind of cover it up and stuff for the, for about a month or so um, before announcing and, and taking very, very aggressive action immediately. Um, the United States, as I said, uh, January 25th, by, by January 25th, China had 930 million people on lockdown. Uh, America, you know, the president of the United States was still saying this wasn't good a big issue already just, you know, a few days ago, a week ago or something, um, you know, was was really downplaying it, was not telling us how many ventilators are available, uh, what the status is, and that's changed. I mean, we're starting to see press briefings by President Trump where he's reading, <laughs> having to read a document that says what the facts are because um, he, the American public does not trust him with uh, information by itself coming out of his mouth uh, with good reason and people have 
are already making charts showing uh, statements that he made on the timeline of uh, the increase in terms of cases. Now, China, the, the government of China right now is feeling somewhat, you know, good because, you know, uh, infection rates are way, way down. They seem to have gotten, you know, con contained it. Um, they shouldn't feel too comfortable for too long. Modern China, when I say modern China, I mean, you know, the China since it became sort of capitalistic and, and became global, entered the global economy, has not really experienced a major economic downturn. Well, it hasn't experienced a major economic downturn. It was not hurt, hit as hard in 2007, 2008. Uh, this time's different. Uh, this time will be different. Like I said, uh, the, the shutdown itself was a huge blow to the Chinese economy, you know, biggest blow in 40 years. Uh, the fall in spending that we're going to see over the next several months is going to be another huge blow. Um, and so what this will mean for for the government of China is, is unclear right now. Um, but the United States and China are linked together in many different ways. Uh, yeah, and I think, you know, one of the things that I want, really want to stress is that, you know, you're you know, it's up to lots of younger people, I think, who are maybe more used to thinking in terms of systems, who understand now things like exponential growth uh, and so on, the importance of uh, of science and so on to really lead the way in demanding uh, transparency and, and action from, from our governments. Um, I know that, you know, there's a rough time for you, for all of you, as, you know, you're about to go enter, enter the job market, um, you know, this is also a time to remember what's really important. So, you know, these these young students have, uh, young students, uh, these students have, um, you know, made the hire me <clears throat> uh, thing uh, across their hats and so on. But, you know, the real kind of lesson from from the slide is that they probably had fun making this together. Um, and so even in, you know, in a time of great uncertainty we can uh you know work together and you know make the best best of it um you know i know you're all at home or i hope you're all at home uh if you want to watch some things that are you know related to the to the topic uh you know chernobyl is a, is a great show you know five part mini series about uh how the soviet union just bungled their response to the break to the nuclear meltdown at chernobyl how they tried to cover it up uh it's also about the heroic doctors and scientists who tried to get the information out there um, Netflix has a documentary series called Pandemic, um, which, you know, obviously talks about pandemics and there are a lot of you know, obvious reasons why that would be relevant <clears throat> uh, for, for today. But if, you know, you don't want, if you want to sort of escape from the COVID-19, uh, you know, pandemic uh, stuff and you don't want to just escape into learning more about other terrible disasters there on there's a video on the internet put myself over up up over here there's a video on the internet of an empty aquarium in chicago where the penguins were allowed to go wander around um if you remember <laughs> uh, we watched a brief video earlier about penguins slipping on ice so um you know this is a pretty adorable video so you know at least the penguins got to have a have a have a good time uh, for a day. So try to hang in there. I know I know a lot of you are are, are trying to to handle handle some very difficult, confusing, uncertain uh, circumstances. Um, as I said, just hang in there, and I will send out an email probably in a couple of days with maybe more announcements in terms of the class and uh, anything like that. So. Um, as, again, you know, we are Penn State and we'll be, you know, we'll, we'll get through. Um, all right. Dr. Nielsen signing off.